Hello and welcome to the Booktopia podcast. I'm Olivia Freaker, Senior Content Producer and Editor of the Booktopian blog. And joining me today is Joe Lewin, Booktopia's Head of Trade Product. Welcome, Joe. Hi, Olivia. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm excellent. Big news overnight. Yeah, very big news. Um, our topic today is the number one news item trending across the book world right now. And that is the announcement of the 2020 Booker Prize shortlist which was revealed about 10 p.m. last night in London uh, via a digital podcast. Uh, very exciting news. It is. Uh, yeah, so the six shortlisted books we have are The New Wilderness by Diane Cook, uh, This Mournable Body by Tsitsi Dangarumba, Burnt Sugar by Avni Doshi, The Shadow King by Marza Mengiste, uh, Shaggy Bane by Do Douglas Stewart, and Real Life by Brandon Taylor. So it's a bit of a surprise shortlist. Um, yeah. but correct me if I'm wrong, Joe. Uh, you've read most of them, yes? Um, I have read, I've read four out of, oh, well, three and a half out of six. So I was yeah. working my way through, um, I was working my way through the long list. I was hoping to have it all read by the time the shortlist was announced. <laughs> I didn't quite get there. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I've read a good portion of them. Um, there's, you know, there's a few omissions that are pretty surprising the most surprising obviously yeah. is uh the mirror and the light by hillary mantel so um hillary mantel um won the booker prize for um her novel wolf hall uh she became the first person to win the booker prize for two books in a series when she won for the sequel to wolf hall uh bring up the bodies and so this book being the third in the trilogy, this would have really rounded it out. It would have made it a, um, a completely unprecedented um, achievement for one author to win a book a prize for three books in a series. Um, she's not been shortlisted, which is a real surprise. Um, I have to say, I did have a weird feeling that they were going to do that because yeah. it seems very much in line with I don't want to say modus operandi, but the booker does have a tendency to pull the rug out from underneath its followers. I mean, um, it does. I can't remember what the big upset what was last year, but. Well, oh, the big well, upset last year was that they awarded two prizes. Yes, of course. Um, and also we've talked about the omission of really popular authors with really beloved books. Like, I guess one example yeah. is Normal People by Sally Rooney. Um, and do we think that's Hamnet, a deliberate? I know you were devastated that Hamnet didn't get into the um, long list. I was, but then I was vindicated because it won the Women's Prize for Fiction. So I feel a lot better. Um, yeah. But that's another prize that Mantel was shortlisted for and also missed out on. Um, but she did make the shortlist. So yeah. it feels like a, it feels a little bit um, as, as much as I do think this is an interesting and really valuable shortlist. Um, just on the surface of it, surface of it. Um, there's no denying that Mantel's book is such an achievement and it was such a, you know, a titanic effort. Um, so it's interesting that they've chosen to buck convention and maybe, and go with four debuts. I think yes. four out of six of the novels are debut novels. Yeah, which is major. Um, very major. Um, yeah. Um, have there been any other shock admissions, do you think? I was a bit surprised not to see, well, not surprised, but it's Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reid isn't on the short list. And that's a very much, I wouldn't say beloved, but it's a very popular novel. Um, yeah, see, that one I thought, I was really surprised to see that on the long list because it's such a, um, mm. like, I really enjoyed that book, don't get me wrong, really loved it. Yeah. But at, at its heart, it's a it's a popular fiction novel. It's not what I would call a literary book. Um, you know, it's very yeah. issues driven, um, shines a light on, you know, lots of parts of society that we don't like to think about, but it's mm. not literary. It's, it's um, you know, it, it would, I would have been very surprised to see a book follow the trajectory of going from Reese Witherspoon's book club and then winning the Booker Prize. That to me is, you know, mm. it, it just didn't, it didn't fit on the list. Um, so, you know, yeah. we've got Lee Child on the, on the, on the panel. He's obviously a, a blockbuster, mm. uh, crime author. So maybe we shouldn't be so surprised that um, a more popular fiction title made its way on there, but I would have been very surprised mm. to see it win. 
Yeah, I have to say, um, I would be surprised to have seen it win. Um, it's interesting that there's that distinction that it's the Booker Prizes for literary fiction, um, which is kind of a contentious um, label within, you know, the book world. People are always going on about like what makes a novel literary as opposed to popular and I think that book, um, Such a Fine Age, is an interesting exploration of that idea that it's being mm. just, like received by establishment as literary, but perceived by readers as being more general popular fiction. And like yeah. does that distinction really matter? Yeah, end? I guess it I guess it doesn't. If if the book um if the book mm. is good enough and it makes people feel things, then um uh then great. But for me, I I read that book and I felt things for the characters and I, I enjoyed the ride and everything, but it didn't, um, it didn't make me question the essence of human nature, the way I feel about, a, a, a something that I see as more, as more literary and it didn't explore storytelling and it didn't, um, it did, it just, it was just a different kind of book. It is a really yeah. difficult distinction to, um, to define. Yeah, definitely. Um, so to avoid dragging on the discussion about book, books that weren't shortlisted, um, <laughs> <laughs> as much as I would love to actually sit down and have a chat about uh, Such a Fun Age, it's just one of those books. Um, are there any books that did make the shortlist that you particularly loved? Um, I really loved Shuggy Bane. I found that book um, just utterly charming and I love the character of Shuggy Bane. I love um people who know me know I love a um a depressing book. Um <laughs> <laughs> Shuggy Bane is depressing. It's very bleak. It's set um in the outer suburbs of Glasgow, um a very working class um family with a um a mother who you know has um substance abuse problems, um, a son, Shuggy, um, who doesn't fit with the other children. He's not a macho boy. Um, and it's, it's just a, a constant, their life seems to be a constant struggle. And yet, like with all fantastically depressing books, um, the characters show this um, inner strength and resilience that, um, eventually makes you feel um, uplifted and feel hope for human humankind. Um, I love a little bit of um, uh, Scottish slang. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's mostly written in, in plain in English, but a lot of the, um, a lot of the dialogue, um, you know, I, I learned a bit of new uh, vocabulary. <laughs> Um, and very, very evocative um, descriptions mm. of these super bleak housing estates um, in mm. uh, suburbs that used to be thriving coal mining, um, coal mining areas where, you know, all of the workers dried up, everyone is unemployed. Um, super bleak. Loved, loved it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about the rest of the shortlist? Did, were there any that you liked or, you know, maybe there's room to talk about ones that you didn't quite vibe with but um well i think that would be interesting to chat about if you're up for it <laughs> <laughs> uh look i never like to speak ill of a book because i think there's something mm. for everyone and obviously these six books have been chosen because the judges saw things in them that they loved um mm. i did not vibe with the new wilderness at all um interesting. It, it's a post-apocalyptic um post-apocalyptic story of survival um of a woman and her child um they're in this zone called the new wilderness the city has become uh so unhealthy for people um so overcrowded that a very small portion of the population are selected for an experiment where they go and live in the wilderness, but the um, the um, proviso is that they have to live in a very primitive way. Um, to me, the concept was interesting, but the plot kind of limped along a little bit. It didn't 
I felt like they just went from catastrophe to to catastrophe without having a, a really satisfying plot arc. And I felt like a lot of the concepts were things that I've read in a lot of books recently. Um, so, look, you know, obviously a lot of people are going to love this book and obviously the judges mm-hmm. loved it, but for me it, it wasn't really my thing. It's interesting because this is what I, one of the ones I'm really interested in because I've been bombarded with stuff that I've had to read that's been coming out and I haven't been able to give the short list as much attention as I'd like. Uh, yeah. But I do have this one. I got it from NetGalley and I'm really looking forward to reading it. But um, it's, it's interesting that um, I would have thought that plot would have been a big driver of a novel like this because it usually kind of is in those kind of, I hate to say cli-fi novels, but that's essentially what they are. Um, yeah, yeah. And look, um, I, I guess I could draw parallels between this novel and uh, Richard Powers' The Overstory, which was also, mm. I think, shortlisted for the Booker Prize a couple of years ago. I read that book and I found it, it's ba- that book to me was just a fictionalisation of um, The Secret Life of Trees, I think it's called, by, I forget his, his name, but there's a, a very well-known non-fiction book about um you know the way trees and um forest ecosystems operate and this was kind of just inserting a plot into that book that book is still beloved it's still selling like Mm. crazy people love that book and it wasn't for me so i don't think me disliking a book is necessarily um Mm. uh necessarily something that people should take on board and say you know i'm not going to read it because joe didn't like it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, I'm curious to know if you've read Burnt Sugar because our fiction buyer Ben read that and loved it. Um, it's really a story about the... Burnt Sugar. That is one that I haven't read, mm. um, but I am fascinated. Um, I am fascinated. I am really looking forward mm. to um, to reading that one. Have you read it, Olivia? I have not, but it is also another one that I'm really wanting to read. It's a another debut about mothers and daughters obsession and betrayal um by the indian american author abney doshi um yeah it just sounds like i'm a sucker for a good mother daughter story i think because yeah. just it's such a complex relationship um for everyone and this one's meant to be really caustically witty but also um i guess still really moving um it's Pegged for fans of Hot Milk by Deborah Le- Levy, which yeah. I haven't read either. I've read that one. That, that's great, that, that book. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. And I'm really looking forward to reading um, Real Life by Brandon Taylor, which is the other one on the Me list too. that I haven't started yet. Yeah, I really want to read that. Everyone that I've seen has read it, has really enjoyed it. And um, for listeners, it's one of those, um, it's a campus novel, I guess, about, um, a young man who spent his summer breeding worms in a lab, um, but his father, he, I think he's had a bit of a difficult childhood growing up in Alabama. His father died a few weeks ago and he hasn't told anyone. And it's, it takes place over the course of one weekend. Um, I just, I'm really looking forward to reading this one. And it's from a staff writer at Literary Hub. Um, he's quite popular on Twitter. I, see, I always see him popping up. Um, so, yeah, this is the one that I think I'm really most keen to read on the shortlist. Yeah, sounds really fascinating. Hey, I love those um, those um, uh, sort of claustrophobic, short time period, detailed, character-driven novels, and that's exactly what this sounds like it's going to be. So um, very exciting. Um, uh, this Mournable Body by Cici Dangaremga, I know that you have read her first novel. Is that right? Yeah, Nervous, Nervous, Conditions. Nervous Conditions. Yeah. Um, and her, have you had a dip into to the new one? No, not yet, but I'm, I would be interested in revisiting, which I'm pretty sure I said in our previous podcast about the longest. Mm. Um, I'm consistent in my bad behaviour when it comes to reading. <laughs> but, um, uh, Zitsi's been in the news recently herself um she was arrested at an anti-corruption protest in zimbabwe um interestingly she's the only non-american author on the shortlist um, she is she's from zimbabwe as i mentioned um and she's filmmaker playwright and activist in her own right so she's very 
I wouldn't be surprised if this one wins because it's her first novels like 30 years later from Nervous Conditions, which was her debut and it was widely acclaimed to the point where we are studying it in university. I studied it at UNSW. Um, so I wouldn't discount Sitsi Dangaremba. Um, yeah. This, this one, yeah. This one is set in Zimbabwe in a youth hostel and um, it's just about a young woman trying to make a life for herself under a painful present, um, which drives her to a breaking point, according to the blurb. I'm really interested in this one too, actually, now that I'm reading more about it. Um, it yeah, it's a, really, it's a really interesting novel. It's, um, it portrays a woman who's living a, a painfully lonely life where she's trying to do better than, um, than her family and the people that she's known back in her village, um, but comes up against um, adversity after adversity. Um, and one of those books where you're constantly saying, no, don't do that. Don't go there. Don't, don't, mm. don't say that in the same way that you do in a, in a, um, in a horror film almost, because she just makes, seems to make mistake after mistake. And I, I guess when you read the book and you think of, um, the privileged position that, um, I know I come from, uh, I've had every opportunity to make good decisions throughout my life and face adversity in, um, in ways where I'm, I'm supported. Um, she's this person who's out on her own and makes a series of um, poor decisions, acts on impulses. Mm -hmm. Things just seem to get worse and worse through the book um, for her, even though she has such high hopes and ambitions for herself. Um, so mm -hmm. it's, it's a bit of a painful read. It, it has you cringing um, at some of the things that she does, uh, but always hoping that she gets it together. Mm. Um, and that's one of two novels set in Africa. There's another one, The Shadow King, which is set in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. um, have you read that one? Um, I'm halfway through that one. Um, I'm finding that one really, really fascinating. Um, so it is, um, that one is a historical novel. So it's set uh, primarily in 1935. Um, and it's set in a period of history that I know very, very, very little about. So I know practically nothing about African history. Um, it's yeah. set um, during the invasion of Ethiopia by Mussolini, which is something I didn't even know happened. That's how terrible my knowledge of history is. Um, and uh, follows a young woman, once again, a young woman from uh, a poor village uh, she's been um, in uh, servitude to a rich um, Ethiopian family. And then when that family mm -hmm. goes to war, her, um, her life becomes, um, is upended again. So she's taken from her village and set to work in this family, which she dislikes mm -hmm. strongly. She then gets taken from that family and um, sent off into, mm -hmm. um, into war zones, which is... Um, you know, turns her life upside down again. So um, I'm only halfway through. No spoilers. I don't know what happens to her. I'm sure everything is going to be just fine. Um, but it is a really, really interesting um, look into a period that I, I know very little about. Yeah. Well, overall, it just sounds like such a fascinating shortlist. And um, just looking at the comments from the judges, Margaret Busby, who... Um, is the chair of the judging panel this year. Um, her comments were, the best novels often prepare our society for valuable conversation, and not just about the inequities and dilemmas of the world, uh, whether in connection with climate change, forgotten communities, old age, racism, or revolution when necessary, but also about how magnificent the interior of the mind, imagination, and spirit is in spite of circumstance. Um, so just listening to you talk about all those novels really, like, the weight of the judge's comments really has been really driven home. Um, what do you think that this shortlist says about the current state of the book world or just the world at large? Um, yeah, look, I think it's, it's is, fantastic you know, to see a really, um, a really diverse list. I mean, we've got, uh, we've got four women and two men on, on this list. Yeah. Uh, we've got a, a reasonable balance of um, LGBTQI plus um, authors, uh, we've got authors of colour, 
you know, that's really fantastic to see that um, mm. that lots of different points of view are being presented to the judges. Um, uh, so that's really great to see. It's, um, I guess it is a little bit unbalanced in the sense that of the six, um, of the six shortlisted authors, five of them are US citizens, even though a lot of them are. So Avni Doshi is of Indian descent. Um, Maza Mengista is of um, Irish descent. Uh, not Irish descent, Ethiopian descent. Ethiopian. <laughs> it's a long yeah. way from Ireland. Um, mm. you know, there, there are a lot of diverse backgrounds, but essentially they all mm. are either from the US or they, they hold US citizenship. Um, mm. So, you know, I know that, that that upsets a lot of the old guard of, of UK authors and publishers because initially the, um, the Booker Prize used to only be open to uh, Commonwealth countries and I think the fear was that it would get taken over by US authors. Um, mm. But I think at the end of the day, it, it comes down to the books that are presented um, and if these are the books that... that one out in in the way the the judges reviewed then so be it yeah um i think a common criticism that i've seen leveled at the inclusion of american authors has come from american readers actually they enjoy they enjoyed the booker prize because it introduced them to books that weren't necessarily given as much coverage in the american um, publishing sphere um, Whereas this year it's very much, as you've said, all Ameri mostly American books. Um, I don't know. I don't necessarily think it's all good or all bad. Um, mm. You know, especially as, as you've said, um, if these books really are, you know, what the judges think is the best of the best. And I think it's good to see that they're taking on, um, well, early, earlier this year with the Black Lives Matter protests and there was a huge kind of cultural shift in the way that we look at culture and who presents it, who's the gatekeepers. And this seems like a very concerted um, and long overdue effort by the establishment to recognise um, authors of colour, particularly black authors, um, which is great. And I would like to see it continued on instead of, you know, just being a singular effort this year because it was culturally relevant. Um, yeah, look, I think that's yeah. something that's that's been, you know, authors of colour have been fairly well represented um, for a number of years in the in the Booker Prize. One thing that I think is interesting, another thing that I think is interesting this year is um, the. It seems to it seems from an outsider to be a concerted effort uh, to recognise emerging authors over established mm. authors so when you look at the long list and you've got hillary mantel you've got colin mccann you've got ann tyler those three mm. all missed out on uh getting into the short list and um you know so tsitsi den garimba is a um you know an author that ha an established author but um are any of the other ones you said there were four debuts yeah, four debuts. Maza Mingiste also wrote another novel. I can't, right. I will find out. For you. I've got it. I've got it here. It, she's also written a novel called Beneath the Lion's Gate. Right. Um, which but isn't really is... a long history no, of, of established writing, you know, in, in terms yeah. of traditional publishing. And all of these novels were, these six novels were reasonably modest releases. They didn't have huge marketing mm. budgets, they're not household names like Anne Tyler and Hilary Mantel. Um, you know, even though, you know, Titi mm. Dangrembe is um, very well respected and studied at university, she's hardly, um, mm. she's hardly a household name. So mm. whether that's a, um, a considered choice by the judges or if that's just the way that ships mm. fell, it seems, um, mm. you know, it seems there is a real focus on emerging voices. Which is interesting. Yeah. You know, you don't want the prize to be stuck in, you know, oh, well, Hilary Mantel is going to win again. It's always going to be someone mm -hmm. old and white. Um, that, that, that's a good thing. Yeah. Whereas it's, it seems like they're trying to avoid what happened last year with um, Margaret Atwood being nominated for the Testaments. And mm. it, that kind of, as we've spoken about before, it kind of did feel like an effort to, you know, repair the damage done when they didn't award it to The Handmaid's Tale the first time. Yeah. Um, 
And that may have been at the expense of Bernadine Evaristo, who mm. also won Girl, Woman, Other. But I would argue that that book has also done quite well. I've seen a lot of people reading it and loving it. So Absolutely. she hasn't exactly fun, but it still was a little bitter, I think. It was a little bitter. And it's, it's sort of the, the testaments, I guess, didn't need the prize. People mm. were going to read the testaments regardless of whether it won the booker or not. It, it was already very, very strongly selling. And when it won the booker, you know, maybe it, the sales increased by 10% or something like that. Um, whereas with Bernadine Evaristo, I think that before, before she was nominated for the prize, we'd, at, you know, at Booktopia, we'd sold a very, very small mm. handful of copies. And we've now gone on to, you know, 12 months later, it's still continually in our bestsellers lists. It's, um, it's a, a book that everyone needs to read. And when you jump onto yeah. um, social media, there's always someone on there singing its praises, which is fantastic that a prize like this can bring um, a reasonably unknown author into the public eye in that way. Mm. Yeah, I agree. Um, so speaking of kind of sales, uh, do you have any... I know it's only been a few hours, really, but do you have any, any idea of, um, you know, has there been a big bump in sales of the shortlist today? Um, can you tell already which ones our customers are gravitating towards? Today, but there is always a big, mm -hmm. a big bump in, uh, in sales for shortlisted titles because it, I guess for a lot of people it gives them uh, a signpost of where to find great quality mm -hmm. literature. Um, and you know, it's, it's always a bit of a scramble once the winner is announced mm -hmm. because, um, you know, that the, the winner definitely goes on to the, the to be read pile for a lot of people. So, um, yeah, I think any of these books are going to be, um, are going to be valuable to the reading public. You know, it's, it's a good yeah. thing. Any, any one of these six books, even the one that I didn't really like, um, I'm really pleased to see that one of these is going to win and then, then it's going to go onto the bedside tables of a lot of Australians and people all over the world. I think it's great. Yeah, me too. Well, I guess we should wrap up. Um, I guess final thoughts on the book and shortlist. Who do we think will win now? Oh, that's a hard one. That is a really yeah. hard one. Gut feel, even though I haven't read it, read it Real Life by Brandon Taylor. Mm -hmm. That was a, a total um, mm. uh, impulse impulse choice. <laughs> I'm going to put my money there. How about you? Excellent. I think I'm going to stick with my initial judgment of This Mournable Body by Sidsi Dangaremba. I think yep. um, just given her situation outside of the Booker Prize, I think I can very, I can very easily see them awarding it to her. Yeah, kind of a recognition of her work. Yeah. Well, as always, this was really interesting chat. Yeah, um, with you, Liv. <laughs> this was fun. Um, for our listeners at home, you can order any of the books on the 2020 Booker Prize shortlist from booktopia.com.au. And thanks so much for listening. Thank you for listening to the Booktopia podcast channel. Don't forget, you can subscribe to us on SoundCloud and iTunes for free and get access to hundreds of author discussions, book analysis pieces and more. Or if your eyes need a workout, head to Booktopia TV on YouTube. Don't forget, for all books featured in this podcast and for access to a whole bunch of other fun content on our blog, head to Booktopia. Australia's local bookstore at booktopia.com.au